Bene, buon pomeriggio, ben ritrovati. Grazie a tutti per una partecipazione così numerosa, per l'interesse espresso verso questa tematica, verso, verso questo webinar. Un webinar speciale in cui ho il piacere di, di avere ospite un amico, il dottor Adam J. J. Hill dell'Università di Derby, e di affrontare un argomento abbastanza interessante. Ehm, consentitemi prima di tutto, soprattutto per gli amici italiani, di esprimere la mia vicinanza a tutti gli operatori professionisti del mondo dello spettacolo che a causa dell'emergenza dell coronavirus adesso incominciano a patire una, una crisi, oltre quella già vissuta, che determina uno stallo, rappresenta uno stallo cui eh, la politica purtroppo ancora non sta dando risposta. Ecco, a tutti gli operatori dello spettacolo, ai professionisti amici e non italiani, esprimo la mia solidarietà, la mia vicinanza. Dicevo, una, un webinar molto interessante, parleremo di eh, decorrelazione tra segnali e sorgenti sonore, nell'ambito live sound e il dottor Adam Hill ci illustrerà una serie di eh, nuove sue ricerche che eh, sono orientate proprio in tal senso. Quindi faccio il mio benvenuto al professor Adam Hill. Welcome. Adam, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Unfortunately, my Italian's a little rusty. Ok, io ho conosciuto il professor Adam Hill eh, in occasione dei miei studi sugli effetti dei palchi e pedane sulle configurazioni cardioide e sulle configurazioni di subwoofer in generale. L'ho incontrato alla convention AES di Milano, eh, abbiamo discusso proprio su questo punto, eh, trovando molte affinità nelle tue nelle ricerche in questo campo, dato che il professor Adam Hill è stato il primo a intraprendere eh, questa tipologia di studio. Bene, prima di lasciare spazio al, al dottor Adamil, introduco i moderatori che vi illustreranno un po' le informazioni tecniche inerenti allo svolgimento di questo webinar. Ok, Abe? Hello, can you see me? Um, I'm Abe Scheel. I'm a sound system and acoustic consultant and sound engineer based in Ireland. I'll be in the Zoom chat today for any questions in English. Raphael will be looking after Facebook Live and Alberto will be in Facebook Live and Zoom chat for people with questions in Italian. And now I'll leave you over to Dr. Adam J. Hill for his presentation. Adam is currently an associate professor in electroacoustics in the entertainment engineering group at the University of Derby. He also works seasonally as a, as a live sound engineer at Gand Concert Sound, located just outside his hometown of Chicago. He is chair of the AAS Technical Committee on Acoustics and Sound Reinforcement and head of content for the Institute of Acoustics Electroacoustics Group Committee. On Adam's website, you will find several great articles, papers, and some interesting software. Um, it's adamjhill.com. Uh, let's see if I can bring it up here. Um, are you there, Adam? Yep. All right. Um, yeah, go okay, let's it. see if I can share my screen. Here we go. Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. I uh, hope you can see my, my screen now. You should see the presentation up there. Um, so this is potentially a controversial topic, um, one in which I get mixed responses when I talk to uh, live engineers about. Um, essentially, what I'm going to be talking about today is making your sound uh, reinforcement imperfect for the sake of the perceptual experience of audience members to become more perfect, if that makes sense. Um, just stealing from um, one of uh, Fidelli's slides that he just showed, um, I'm trying to create ordered disorder, um, hence audio signal decorrelation for live sound. Um, so I've decided to pitch this at a fairly technical level. 
Um, so you get a good understanding of exactly what I'm doing. Um, and it's not just so much me waving my hands in the air, um, pretending that I'm doing some, uh, you know, audio magic. Uh, I'm not, this is all just, uh, you know, proper engineering, um, hopefully well thought out stuff. Uh, um, sorry, Adam. Yeah. Uh, we're not seeing your screen right now. We're yeah, still seeing Fledel. Oh, okay. okay. Now we're, now we're good. Thank you. Are you seeing it? Okay. Yeah, I didn't. now it's okay. Okay. Um, so... Yeah, uh, I'm going to take you through how the algorithms works, how it was developed, uh, some various versions of, um, of it, uh, and then talk about some applications. Um, I will, along the, the course of the presentation, try to do some demos. I know that's very much walking a tightrope tight um, for these sort of uh, online um, webinars, but uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, so here we go. So, quick problem overview. Um, I think uh, Fideli uh, discussed this quite well from what I could pick up um, uh, in his uh, intro. Uh, but generally in live sound, what we're looking for, at least what I think we're looking for, that's what I'm looking for, uh, is number one consistent audience coverage. So every seat in the house should be getting, uh, at the very least, the same tonal response. Um, and if you can do it, and if it's appropriate, uh, the same sound level as well. Uh, some companies out there uh, promote this um, as you know, similar phrases like democracy of sound. Uh, on top of that, it's not just about getting a consistent, let's say, magnitude and level response. Uh, you need to look in the time domain as well. Uh, and I've done some previous work on this. Really, where I'm convinced that the time domain is potentially more important than the frequency domain. Um, you've got to get the time domain right. That's one of the big experiences uh, in live sound is that impact that you get, especially from the low end. Um, I've been doing some work with AES over the past couple of years where um, our research has found that it's the time domain accuracy in the low frequency region, which contributes a significant portion to the overall audience listing experience. So if you get that right here, a good way of the way there. Um, in doing a good job in, uh, in live sound. So we're looking for sharp transient response, high quality sound, whatever that means. I'm sure we'll all have a different idea of that. Um, and also, you know, to add to the complexity, we want to have amazing sound in the audience and minimal to no energy outside of the audience. So good luck with that. Uh, we're not going to be talking about that today. Uh, that's a talk for uh, a subject for an entirely different talk. So the common challenges, this is really what we're up against uh, in trying to achieve these goals. Uh, number one, it's got to be budget. Uh, and I think it's easy to forget about this, especially kind of with my academic hat on. You know, you'll, you'll sit in the office, sit in the lab, dreaming up some crazy ideas to make uh, you know, sound as good as possible for as many people as possible. Uh, but a lot of the time, reality is, is very much opposed to some of these crazy ideas. And ultimately, it comes down to budget. Um, you know, if your production can only afford five subwoofers, six subwoofers, that's what you're stuck with and you have to work with it. Uh, tied to that is truck space. Um, you know, I, I spent, since I was a teenager working for GAN Concert Sound, uh, where a good chunk of my time is spent uh, packing as much gear into a truck as possible. Um, and that's a big one. Um, you know, it's, you know, if you're out on a tour, uh, you have, you're competing for truck space with uh, you know, audio, lighting, video, staging, rigging, whatnot, um, you know, and that's not insignificant. You can't say I'm going to have an entire truck full of subwoofers uh, because that costs a lot of money. Um, on top of that, sight lines. So I was working with um, John Burton when he was um, engineering the Prodigy on one of their last tours. I think their last, their last tour, actually. Um, and we came up with the best possible subwoofer system for their uh, arena tour as being um, an array of subwoofer stacked three high. And it looked great on paper until we said, okay, how tall is this going to be? Oh, right. It's going to be taller than, you know, the average audience member. So they're not going to be able to see the stage. So scrap that idea. You know, we need to consider sight lines. Uh, venue capabilities, especially if you're working in older venues, you might not be able to rig subs. Um, even your main line arrays will be limited in some venues. Um, so you do have to consider what is actually possible. Um, and on top of everything else, it's time. Uh, you know, a lot of gigs that I've done, you've got about four hours from the time the truck doors open until you need to be ready for sound check. Um, and that's not a lot of time. It's not time for fine tuning and trial and error. Uh, you got to you got to get it right the first time. Um, so 
a lot of practical challenges that you need to keep uh, in mind when talking about any sort of system optimization. Okay, uh, right, you wanted to hear about audio and acoustics, and I've just been going on about budgets and truck space and sight lines, uh, which has nothing to do with audio and acoustics, so uh, let's get back on point. So comb filtering. Comb filtering is one of the biggest problems when we're talking about uh, low frequency sound reinforcement, so coming out of the subwoofers. Uh, I hear a lot of engineers out there saying, oh, I couldn't get the low frequencies right because of room modes. Um, and I think this is true if you're working in a very small reverberant venue, uh, you do have to deal with room modes. But it's pretty easy to prove that in medium to large size venues, room modes just aren't a problem. They're not something that we perceive. Um, you know, there's this uh, thing called the Schroeder frequency, where any frequency above that, you still have room modes, but you can't hear them. Uh, in most venues, if you go into an arena, your Schroeder frequency is about two hertz. Uh, so you're not hearing anything in terms of room modes there. In a medium venue, you might be at 20, 25 hertz. Uh, so room modes aren't really a problem. Uh, the problem that we're dealing with is comb filtering, and that's really what this decorrelation is trying to solve. Um, at high frequencies, if you move around a venue that's suffering from comb filtering, you might hear a phasiness as you move around. Although I will say with a lot of the modern day uh, line array systems, um, there's very good isolated zones of coverage where you're only getting covered by a single element. Um, so you perhaps get less faciness than you would with an old conventional wall of speakers that you'd get kind of 20, 30 years ago. But at low frequencies is really where our problem is at. As you walk around an audience, and it could be just a few meters moving um, from left to right, um, sometimes front to back, depending on what's going on, uh, but you'll hear clear peaks and dips at certain frequencies, where I could be standing in one position and be getting pummeled by, let's say, 63 hertz, and move two meters to my side and not hear 63 hertz at all. Um, and that's kind of, you know, what we're listening for when you hear kind of watch system technicians acting like weirdos, kind of pacing around a big field at a music festival, you know, when they're tuning the PA, you know, we're listening for dead spots and, and kind of hot spots um, for low frequencies and looking for consistency of coverage. So it's a big problem and it's all due to coherent interference between either multiple direct sounds receiving, being received at the same location um, simultaneously or direct sounds and early reflections interacting with one another. We'll talk about kind of the, the ins and outs of that um, in a little bit. So for those of you who uh, maybe aren't familiar with, this, uh, with the theory side of things, uh, comb filtering um, essentially is following the principle of superposition. So if you turn, let's say, your loudspeaker on the left arm and take a measurement, let's say you play a sine wave through that, you'll get a sine wave at the listing location. If you turn that speaker off and then turn the right-hand speaker on, play the sine wave, you'll get another sine wave at that frequency at your location. If you turn both the speakers on at once, you may get a really strong sine wave or you may get nothing at all, depending on the phase relationship uh, between those two waves that are uh, reaching you. So the coherent interference issue, it assumes that sources that are being summed uh, at a single listing lo uh, location are directly related to one another. In other words, they're st statistically um, almost identical. So that could be multiple sources being fed the same signal as you would get in a loudspeaker array, or it could be a single loudspeaker where you have one reflection off the wall. That will also sum um, as coherent interference giving you potential comb filtering. So for sine waves, this is, uh, this is the issue. If the two sine waves you're receiving are in phase, you'll get pressure summation, so that's twice as much. So in the logarithmic uh, domain, that's plus six dB. Uh, if the two sine waves are 180 degrees out of phase, you'll get nothing. So that's the problem. And you could have people standing a few meters apart in an audience, and one person's getting loads of a certain frequency and the other person's getting nothing. We wanna to try to avoid that and make everyone get the same thing. So this is a quick simulation I did a few years ago just to highlight the problem we're dealing with. So I did uh, a very simple left to right um, configuration. Um, so one speaker there, one speaker there, to the left and right of a stage, that's a bird's eye view. And then you have these colored dots all representing different listener locations in an audience. 
On the right, you see the simulated magnitude response that each individual listening location is receiving. And this is assuming the loudspeakers are perfect and just giving off a flat frequency response. So you see dead center, this red dot, you get a nice flat line. And that's, well, that's ideal, isn't it? That's what we want. If you move even one or two dots off center, all of a sudden, I mean, look at this one. You've got a notch of about 20 dB down at 63 hertz or so. That person's not going to be having a good time. And they're only a couple meters off of dead center. That shows how sensitive this is. Of course, every other dot has a very different frequency response. So everyone standing here is going to have um, a different concert experience where really as an engineer uh, or a system technician, your job really should be to deliver the same experience to everyone, at least the same objective experience. We still don't have mind control. Uh, not yet. I'm sure someone at MIT is working on it. Um, so the common solution, I think this is what most of you will be most familiar with, uh, is we use a ground-based horizontally distributed array of subwoofers. So this is really practical. Uh, it's cheap. You don't need any special rigging. You know, you roll your subwoofers off the truck, park them in place, plug them in, and you're done. Uh, and for the optimization, it's actually fairly straightforward. Uh, and I think the knowledge on this is, is fairly mature. I think, um, you know, the a typical competent system engineer will know um, the basics for optimizing these arrays. So this is just pulled through one of my AES tutorials I gave um, a number of years ago. Um, subwoofer spacing is really important uh, in terms of the extent of comb filtering. So what you're seeing here is uh, a simulation of I'm taking still two sources, uh, perfect frequency response, and I'm gradually pulling them closer and closer together. So the left-hand plot, you're seeing uh, the bird's eye view of the venue where all the blue crosses are listeners. Um, the middle plot is the magnitude response, and these are all normalized to each other. So it just gets sort of propagation delay. And in the right-hand plot, you're just looking at what 60 Hertz is doing spatially. So what you see is it's an absolute mess until the subwoofers get to about maybe two or three meters. Uh, between one another. And then all of a sudden things snap into place and everything is consistent. Um, and that's the basics of, of line array theory, really, um, is that you need to have your sources spaced no more than half a wavelength apart from one another. Um, if they are within half a wavelength, uh, then they will acoustically couple to one another and they effectively they will uh, reproduce sound as a, a coherent source. So that's what we're after. Um, anything outside of that, you're going to have decoupled sources and you're going to have comb filtering, which is what we're trying to avoid. You can also play with array width. So most productions aren't going to have just two subwoofers on the ground. Uh, I know for the Prodigy tour um, that I worked with with John Burton, I think we had maybe 76 subs that were spanning over about 34 meters. Uh, so it's quite the hefty subwoofer array. Um, you know, we were moving quite a bit of air. Uh, but what you see here is I'm starting with a single sub in the middle and then gradually adding stacks of two uh, until we get 22 stacks spanning the whole audience. Um, naturally, you'll see the level going up, but also you're going to see the seat to seat variation go down. Um, and this is really just a brute force approach. Uh, you're still getting a very strong power alley. It's just that with all these stacks, your power alley is very wide. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say this is the way to go for a properly optimized system. Remembering we only have limited truck space. So, you know, having 22 stacks of subs isn't going to be practical for most, uh, most applications. So what we do instead is we choose a reasonable number of subwoofers. In this case, I have six stacks of two subwoofers, so 12 subs total. And I'm going to apply electronic delay uh, to the array to try to um, broaden out uh, the coverage over the audience. So to do this, you choose the delay point behind the subwoofer array. Um, and for these examples, I've started 90 meters back, meaning that it's effectively a flat array. You're not delaying much. And I go as close as to about 30 centimeters behind the array. Whereas the closer you get, the more virtual curvature you get. Uh, so in the right-hand plot, you see these red boxes. Those represent the virtual location of the delayed subwoofers. Um, so what you'll notice, especially in this middle plot, is you kind of get to a sweet spot, sweet spot uh, at a certain delay where all the magnitude responses converge. 
uh, and you have very low variance in the audience. Once you get beyond that, when you're over delaying the array, then you start to get comb filtering, you decouple the array and it's no longer operating as it should be. Um, so this is something that can be optimized um, quite simply, um, usually using software. Um, you, know, you don't really want to be doing back of the envelope calculations for this, um, but you know, this is hopefully well known uh, to people. So the results you can get, this is just an example that I did with GAN Concert Sound, uh, I think last September. Um, this is for a, a fairly large festival up in the state of Wisconsin uh, in the United States, where we had, I think it was either 10 or 12 stacks of two subwoofers. And the guys at GAN, they emailed me, I wasn't even on site, I was back in the UK by then. They said, okay, how do we optimize it? Because it's not working for us, you know, we need some help. Um, so the top plots are showing you the starting point with no optimization. The bottom plot is what I came up with for them, which was just using delay and a bit of spacing optimization. And we got a nice, uh, consistent coverage. So the response we got from this, uh, the engineers who kind of walked the field before their sets were really blown away by it. And it's, it's not rocket science, it's simple stuff. Um, but they were impressed. They said, oh, it sounds the same everywhere. Like, we usually don't get that. Uh, but the problem with this, and it's something to keep in mind, is that this solution has removed power alley. So it's removed maybe that plus 6 dB, plus 9 dB boost that you're getting in front of house at low frequencies. Um, so the system technician from GAN was saying, well, he was, gonna, he was actually having to be a bit careful because the front of house engineers were overdriving the subwoofer system because they're used to having more low end where they're stood than at the sides of the audience. So it takes a bit of calibration from a mix engineer's point of view. Um, but still, nice even coverage, you know, um, considering what the uh, limitations on the system. And yeah, that's kind of something that, that I do regularly with um, the people I work with. So that's all great. We can do a good job with those, but there are reasons why we shouldn't use these. And there are very different reasons, really. Um, practicality could be one of them. Um, I've done shows where the performer needs a walkway down the center of the audience. Uh, so in that case, I physically can't put a centrally located array. Um, it's stage has to go there. Um, you know, and I always you know, talked about at the beginning of this, you know, the, the problems with placing cardioid subs under the stage. Uh, it, it doesn't work. Um, and there could be other reasons, you know, I mean, you've seen some of these um, shots online, photos online of people who have put end fire arrays in front of a stage so that the closest audience member is about 10 meters away from the band. And that you miss the point of live sound. You know, you go to a concert, you go to the front row so you're close to the band. I don't want to be staring at 10 meters of subwoofers. Um, so sometimes you just, you're not able to put these arrays on the ground. Um, also efficiency. Um, I've been going on about this for a few years now. Uh, it's inefficient to put your subs on the ground. Uh, the guys at L Acoustics have put out some really good papers uh, showing that this argument that you lose the waterhouse effect um, when you fly your subs isn't entirely true. Uh, you're not losing 6 dB when the subs go in the air. Maybe at worst you're losing two or three, maybe four dB, uh, but it's not the full blown 6 dB. But what you're gaining by flying the subs is you're getting better front to back consistency in the audience. and I consider that better efficiency because you're delivering what you want to be delivering to more people in the house and you're not having to pummel the people in the front row to get to the levels you want in the back row. So efficiency, I think, is a big one. Basically, if you put your subs on the ground, it's going to be inefficient, um, at least my definition of efficiency. Um, and if you fly them, basically, the higher you can fly them, the more efficient. Um, you can get it. And again, look up L Acoustics paper on this. They did an AES conference paper uh, a few years back um, where they, they quantified this. They put it to an equation um, and it made sense to me. Um, it is quite sensible. Sight lines we talked about, no one's gonna wanna stare at a wall of subwoofers. At least most people won't want to. They wanna see the band. Um, so we can't be flying speakers uh, in between a direct line of sight or in between video walls and the audience. And lastly, I, I'm to the point now where I'm struggling with the safety aspect of ground-based subwoofers. Um, I'm involved with, I'm a consultant on the World Health Organization's Make Listening Safe initiative, where it's exactly that. They're trying to make all types of recreational listening safe. Um, they've already tackled uh, 
personal listening devices, so earbud-based listening. Um, and they've released a pretty useful guidance document on that. I think that came out last year. And now we're working on live events. And one of the big things that's come up here are ground-based subwoofer arrays. Um, and I did some measurements last summer at Pitchfork Music Festival in Chicago where I measured peak values every day of the festival in the front row of the audience, uh, roughly around 140 dBC. Uh, on average, five minute averages, you're between about 120 and 130 dBC um, throughout the show. Uh, I don't think that's safe, and I don't think most people think that's safe. Uh, the only people I can talk to though who have much good information on that sort of uh, noise exposure uh, is NASA. Uh, and if you look at the NASA guidelines for astronauts being exposed to similar uh, low frequency content, they're, they're pretty clear. They say don't do it. Um, but we're doing these ground based subwoofer arrays as standard practice. And I think we need to move away from that at some point, which is where decorrelation comes in, um, which is where, you know, you might have a left right system flown around the ground. And the question is, how do you make that work for everyone across the audience, how do they get the same listening experience without getting uh, significant cone filtering? So just to sum up the conventional alternatives before we get to the algorithm, um, if you wanna use a ground left right stack as an alternative to the centrally distributed array, um, I'd say that's the best option for simplicity. So again, roll them off the truck, stack them up, put them on the sides, that's fine. Um, if you can fly the arrays alongside the main left-right PA, I'd say that's the best option for time alignment or phase alignment, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, you'll be coherent with the main left-right array. And if you're looking at systems um, that are coming out these days, um, you look at D&D's latest array, and that goes down quite comfortably to 50 hertz. Uh, and I've been in arenas where we've optimized the subsystem and then flipped on the main PA and said, oh, mm, wait a minute. That was pretty much useless what we just did because now the main PA is causing all this comb filtering. So if you can fly the subs along with the main left PA, great for time alignment, but you're still gonna get that comb filtering from left to right, um, which we'll talk about today. Uh, if you can manage it, and from my experience, I've been able to do this exactly one time in my entire life, uh, a flown center array of subwoofers. This is best for efficiency in terms of delivering the sound to everyone in the house equally. Um, and it's better for time alignment with the main PA, not perfect, but it's better um, and it's certainly safer. So all of these will suffer from comb filtering uh, to some extent where the first two options will be the most problematic. Okay, so to prevent comb filtering, what we wanna do is decorrelate all the signals as best as we can. The challenge is we need to preserve the sound quality. I can quite easily decorrelate a left-right signal entirely, make it 100% decorrelated, but it's going to sound horrible. You're not going to want to go to that gig. Um, so we need to find a way to do this without impacting sound quality at all. Um, so standard approaches, you can uh, use unique EQ for the left and the right. Uh, again, Fidelity talked about that earlier. Uh, I think he showed a JBL approach to that. That's been around for many years um, and can be done quite easily. Uh, although you are then losing some energy that you could otherwise be outputting from your devices. So you're purposely not sending all your audio contents to both sides of the PA. You can use all pass filters. Uh, I know a lot of consultants who do permanent installs use this. Um, those do work to an extent to make the phase response of the left and the right different. Uh, but those tend to have some audibility issues. They do slightly detract from the sound quality. So maybe not a perfect solution. And I'd say what most people do these days is ignore the problem. Oh, we've got a left-right PA. We've flown the subs left-right. Um, oh, comb filtering, it's fine. We flew the PA, uh, not a problem. Um, so just either ignoring it or just kind of shrugging your shoulders and saying, well, there's nothing we can do about it. So what I'm going to show you today is I think there's potentially something you can do about it that isn't too demanding in terms of the technology you need for it. Oh, yeah. so, um, yes. We have a couple of questions. I don't know if you want to keep going or do Yeah, this is a good stopping point if we have some questions. Okay. Um, Kyria said, does a loss of impact situation take place with delayed arced arrays when the delay values go wild? Hmm. 
That's a very good question. Um, and one in which that I'm just about done with the research project that is hopefully gonna answer that question. Um, I think it's a big consideration if you're going wild, as you say, with the delay values, uh, you're gonna lose the um, fidelity, uh, you know, the, the time domain accuracy um, of what you're reproducing. So I think inevitably there's gonna be smearing. Uh, so yes, I think you have to be careful with that. Um, hopefully I'll have a clearer answer very soon about that that I can share. Okay, and um, Daniel said, how do you get around the issue with flown subs where the floor reflection leads to substantial phase cancellation in balcony seats in an arena or large theater? Um, I'm going to tell you in a few minutes. Great. And uh, yeah, I have a question myself. And that is if you are choosing to do a curved arc or, or subs in the center at all, um, is the comb filtering that happens up the center uh, through the crossover. Um, so like if you, the common approach is that time alignment happens somewhere out, maybe um, a third of the way in from the, from the sides. Um, and that leads to a less power at 80 hertz if that's your crossover up the middle. Is that a, a worse trade-off for a consistent sound? It's a good question. Um, I think that you have to consider that on a case by case basis, seeing what you're shooting for. Um, I will point you towards, and I feel like I'm talking about them too much. I have no affiliation with them, um, but L Acoustics has a white paper that they've just released on time alignment locations and venues, um, talking about those trade offs. Um, and I think it's, it's worth the read. Um, I think it's on their website, um, looking into that. But yeah, I, I think it's it's one of those cases where it kind of is a depends situation. And you can't really say one one size fits all solution, if that makes sense. That's all the questions I think from, yeah, that's all the questions we have from Zoom. I don't know, are there any questions from Facebook? Uh, not yet. Not yet, good. That means they all agree. Okay, um, we'll carry on then uh, and actually get to the, the meat of this webinar and, and possibly why all you're here, uh, you're listening. So static DSP, whatever that is, let's talk about it. So DSP, uh, in this case, stands for diffuse signal processing. So this was developed by Professor Malcolm Hawksford at the University of Essex uh, in the late 90s through the early 2000s uh, with, uh, I think, one of his PhD students named Neil Harris, who some of you may be familiar with um, if you've worked in uh, kind of the hi-fi market uh, in the UK. Uh, the original intention of this was to use them for distributed mode loudspeakers, DMLs, so the flat panel loudspeakers. Uh, and the idea was that they were having some applications where they're using multiple panels uh, to reproduce sound, either a left to right or an array of panels, whatever you, uh, whatever the configuration, they had multiple of these. And the problem was that they were still suffering from comb filtering between the two panels. And so they approached Malcolm uh, at Essex and said, okay, can you come up with a way to decorrelate these two signals? Uh, and they were mainly looking at the mid frequencies and high frequencies. Um, and he did that, he delivered it to them. Um, and for all I know, they incorporated it into their products, uh, which at the company was then known as NXT. So right around, well, a few years after uh, that was done, that's when I started uh, at Essex working on my PhD with Malcolm. Uh, and that's when we started toying with the idea of applying this to conventional loudspeakers, uh, specifically subwoofers, which brings with it a whole host of challenges, which I'll get to soon. So I toyed around with it a bit when I was at Essex about 10 years ago, um, but kind of left it um, just because there were other more pressing projects to, uh, to keep on top of. But a few years back, uh, I think starting in 2015, um, I brought on John Moore. Uh, to do a PhD uh, at Derby, where John took on this project, took on trying to adapt and refine diffuse signal processing to work for conventional loudspeaker systems, where the initial focus was on subwoofer systems, so left-right systems, and getting them to not have comb filtering. So John 
did that, which is mainly what I'm talking about today. Um, you know, I have, have to give a huge tip of the cap to John Moore. Um, you know, a lot of the work today um, was his kind of uh, sweat and blood into this, hopefully not too much blood. Um, but he's now working for Midas Consoles at Music Tribe, uh, where his base is in Manchester in the UK. And um, I know there's some potential for, for kind of developing this further um, on their end, but we'll see as of yet, nothing. Um, so the concept, this is really the starting point, is we want to try to apply some imperceptible low-level noise-like decay onto signals. So a perfect impulse response is one sharp click, so a perfect line uh, in the time domain. What we're doing is add a little bit of squiggle on the end of that, which hopefully you won't be able to hear. The key, and this is something that um, was known in the early 2000s when Hawksford was working on it, but um, John and myself have refined this, is that what's key is getting the frequency dependent decay of this noise to be just right. So if you get too much decay, uh, in other words, the noise persists for too long, then you'll be able to hear the effect of it. If it's too short, then you don't get the decorrelation. So you have to find a happy medium in the middle where it's not perceptible, but you're getting enough decorrelation. Um, and that basically occupied John Moore's time for about three years. Um, so yeah, the challenge is for low frequencies, we're looking in, in excess of 100 milliseconds of decay, uh, especially for the lowest of frequencies. To do this without hearing the effect uh, is challenging to say the least. On top of that, uh, if you stick a microphone up and measure a system that's been decorrelated in this manner, it doesn't look good. Uh, you get a noise-like magnitude response where any system technician um, or consultant seeing that would throw out uh, your algorithm immediately because why in the world would you do that to yourself? Um, so we had to be very careful what these magnitude responses were looking like. I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, effectively, what we're doing is we're applying purposeful controlled phase distortion uh, to the signal. So how we do that is we use these things called temporally diffuse impulses or TDIs. Uh, we synthesize these uh, and this is before you apply it to the signal. So you do this, you know, while you're still sitting at home, you can synthesize a library of these on your computer. Um, it does some of sinusoids. So it goes through every frequency one by one and it adds a sine wave to the signal. The difference between all these sine waves, number one is in frequency, and number two is in its phase. So we're randomizing the phase of all these sine waves. Once we've added the sine wave, uh, before it's added to the output signal, we add a, a frequency dependent exponential decay to that sine wave. So every frequency will decay at a different rate than the other frequencies. And the trick is that these TDIs are different for every loudspeaker in the system. So you have to have the capability to have separate processing for every loudspeaker. Easy if it's a left-right cluster of speakers, then you just need two TDIs, two um, channels of processing, and you're good to go. Um, if you have a horizontally distributed array of speakers or a distributed system, a surround sound system, uh, then you're going to need a lot of processing. Um, and interestingly, one of the first applications of this, um, before John Moore actually took up the work, was I was doing a project um, with uh, a group working with SMPTE, so for cinema sound systems, where we're looking into applying this to give um, a more even coverage over the audience in the cinema. Um, so for that, you would need quite a few channels of processing, which state-of-the-art cinema can deliver live sound, maybe not always. So the key variables, these are the things that we need to optimize, um, are probability density functions. I'll tell you what those are in a second. Length of the TDI and time uh, and the frequency dependent decay function. I and mean, this is just an example TDI you can see here on the right um, showing the noise like decay. Okay, so the probability density function, PDF, this is used when you're randomizing the phase uh, within your TDIs. Um, it tells you basically di the distribution of your phase randomization. So you can have a uniform approach where it's equally probable that you'll get any phase value for any given frequency. Um, we've limited it to just under plus or minus 180 degrees uh, or pi, um, if you're talking about in radians. Triangular, that's the response you get where zero is no phase, and then we're going to the extremes of uh, 
plus or minus 180 degrees, or you can do a binary approach where it's plus or minus 90 degrees. Um, so we tested all of these, um, did a fairly in-depth listening test on this and found that the uniform approach uh, rated the best out of all of them. So we stuck with that. And that's in line with Hawksford work, Hawksford's work uh, in the early 2000s. He ended up using the uniform approach as well. TDI length, like I said, these things need to be long enough to allow for enough decorrelation. Uh, the longer the TDI is, essentially the greater frequency resolution you have for decorrelation. Um, so what we ended up with um, was we found at CD quality, 44.1 kilohertz, you needed 8192 samples to get adequate decorrelation, which equates to a maximum TDI length of 170 milliseconds which is very long, uh, especially when you're talking live sound for real-time processing. I'll get to it later, um, how we get around that. Um, it's not as bad as it seems. Uh, but that gives you a frequency resolution of about five hertz. Uh, you can go further than that, but then again, your TDI is getting very long and uh, a lot more processing hungry. Um, I will note that if you apply this only to subwoofers, uh, you can uh, downsample and downsample it to, I don't know, eight kilohertz. Um, and that will give you much better frequency resolution and really decrease your latency that you're applying to the system. Um, so there's no need, I don't think, to keep it at the full sampling rate, um, but I know there'll be people who argue with me about that, but it's more for a latency reason um, to, to compensate for that. So lastly, the frequency dependent decay function. So this is the big one. This is the one you really need to get right to get the decorrelation to work without destroying your audio quality. It's a compromise, compromise between performance and perceptibility. So if your decay is too long, you lose the sound quality. It's time smearing, no one's gonna like it. It'll lose the impact. It'll just sound really unimpressive. If you go way over the top, it just sounds like, uh, you know, you've filtered your loudspeakers through, um, you know, I don't know, a plastic tube of 10 meters long. It doesn't sound good at all. Um, if the decay is too short, you don't get decorrelation and there's no point in doing it. So this threshold for audibility and decay, it's frequency dependent. Um, and we considered two methods that Hawksford um, proposed and one that Moore developed on his own. And we did a series of listening tests uh, looking into this. So Hawksford's methods, um, the linear and logarithmic ones, which are the dotted line curve and the dashed line curve in the plot on the right, um, those are, were mainly developed for mid-frequency and high-frequency decorrelation. We found when you apply that to a low-frequency signal, it's extremely audible or doesn't give you enough decorrelation. So the linear model was extremely audible and gave you a lot of good decorrelation. The dotted line wasn't so audible, that's the logarithmic method, but it gave you no useful decorrelation for low frequencies. So we kind of discounted that. Moore's method was based on uh, extensive subjective evaluations where this is the solid line curve he came up with for decay constant in milliseconds versus frequency. So this is just a snapshot from um, the paper. It's an AES paper, the reference is at the bottom if you wanna give it a read. Um, but this is the data from those listening tests. Um, and, you know, I, I'm not going to sit here and say that, um, you know, the results were um, entirely conclusive and completely accurate. There was still quite a bit of noise in the data. Um, but through um, subsequent testing of the algorithm, uh, we're fairly confident that we've, we've hit the right values on this and that it's, it's almost entirely imperceptible. So you can see at below 63 hertz, you're looking at about 180 milliseconds of decay you need. Above um, four kilohertz, we're saying 3.7 milliseconds is um, kind of the most you can get away with before it becomes really apparent. Uh, we're not saying you use that, but that's the most you can get away with. So this is just looking at um, a simple, I think a kick drum hit, um, the waveform for that. Uh, unprocessed, that's what you have on top. The second one down is using a linear method, which doesn't look anything like the original sample. That's going to be very audible. The logarithmic method is the third one, and the variable method, which is Moore's method, which is below, which is very similar to what you get um, with the unprocessed signal. And that's the one we've gone with um, for the rest of our experiments. Okay. One 
last thing to talk about. Um, so we've already got our uniform PDF. We've got 170 milliseconds length, and we've talked about the vari variable decay method. We need to talk about equalization. If I don't equalize, you get a magnitude response like you see in this pre-EQ plot. That, again, perceptually, we might not hear it because the notches are so close together, and we've kind of covered this in listening tests, um, you shouldn't be able to perceive that. But if you stick a microphone up and that's what you get, um, yeah, you're gonna be very worried, let's say. Um, so you can use uh, minimum phase equalization to flatten the magnitude response. So that looks all nice for the microphone um, and where you're still maintaining the noisy phase response. So I'm sorry if you're smart users out there, um, you're just gonna have to grin and bear it if you use this, uh, the phase response is not gonna look nice, uh, but we can at least make your magnitude response look normal. Uh, but this is just using a Hilbert transform um, to correct the magnitude response and basically push those nonlinear, not, um, push those variations in the magnitude response onto the phase response. Um, so we've done the EQ. Uh, the last thing, since this is all in the frequency domain, we convert to the time domain, so we get uh, an impulse response, the TDI, which then we convolve um, with uh, your audio signal coming in. Uh, and for analysis, we use spectral smoothing, where we found one twelfth octave smoothing. Uh, no, I lie, one tenth octave smoothing is uh, accurate for low frequency. I just got to stare at my face for a few minutes. Um, in terms of test results, um, these were the actual um, first simulations we did on it. We tested it in an anechoic space um, where we just took two space subwoofers at seven meters apart uh, and measured the spatial variance uh, between all of the different listening locations in the venue. And we tried this 10 different times because we used 10 different sets of TDIs because this is a random process when we generate these. So we want to see what happens when we get a good result or a bad result and how we can kind of filter that. So on average, uh, in the simulation, in an anechoic space, we reduced the um, uh, spatial variance, so the difference between seat to seat and magnitude response by um, a little over 50%. Uh, in the example you see here, uh, this reduced um, by 59%, so this is one of the better examples. Uh, but you can just kind of see the magnitude response is squeezing together. Um, and that's, of course, with one-tenth octave um, spectral smoothing. Um, you know, just to avoid the jaggedness of what you would get due to the phase differences. Um, and through a separate test, we found that the just noticeable difference, the JND for spatial variance, is about 1.8 dB in the subwoofer band. So we achieved just about 1.8 dB, meaning that if you walk around the audience for this situation, uh, you wouldn't hear a difference. Example two was in a virtual acoustic space. So now there are reflections. And this is where things got interesting. So uh, effectively, it was the same experimental setup, uh, except now we increased absorption uh, from nothing, zero, or uh, yeah, no absorption, zero, to fully anechoic, an absorption coefficient of one. What we found, if you look at the graph here, um, you can see the unprocessed spatial variance gets worse and worse as absorption goes up and up, uh, basically because it reveals the comb filtering much more as the room gets drier and drier, where the reflections, it was in a you know very reverberant space, virtual space, um, it kind of masked that comb filtering um, and kind of gave you a more true diffuse field. But what you see, the processing doesn't really start working until you get to about 60% absorption. So that's you know, effectively outdoors. You're not going to get many rooms that have 60% absorption uh, across the spectrum, especially at low frequencies. So this was surprising at first. We're like, okay, what's going on? Why doesn't this work? Some interesting results. It doesn't seem to work inside in a real acoustic space. So the question was why? Why doesn't this work when strong reflections are present? Um, we thought about it and came up with the obvious answer, was that yes, we're decorrelating the direct sound, but we're not decorrelating the early reflections. So I could stick a single subwoofer in a room and you're still gonna get comb filtering from the early reflections. So we need to do something about that. And that's something that this form of decorrelation does not do. Uh, it works fine outside. You can use it all day, no problems for that. 
indoors, you've got a problem, or anytime you have a, a nasty reflection that's causing problems. So that's where dynamic DSP comes in. Um, essentially, what we need to do, this was the idea that John and I came up with, um, was to change the decorrelation process over time. So effectively, every time frame, you have a different temporally diffuse impulse that's doing the decorrelation. What that means is that when an early reflection combines with the direct sound, they're decorrelated in different ways. So they're not correlated together. And so you're not going to get the cone filtering from them. There's um, an illustration on the next slide that shows this, um, or the next slide after this. So how we do this is we pre-generate uh, a set or a library of TDIs for every loudspeaker. So this could be 20 TDIs, 100 TDIs. Uh, I'd say it depends on the reverberation time of the room. Longer reverb means you need longer um, unique TDIs cycling through. And every time frame you cycle to another TDI. Um, so you have a different process, effectively a decorrelation every single time frame. Now this poses a lot of challenges uh, in that you have to vary the TDIs quick enough so that the direct sound and the early reflections are decorrelated from each other. In some rooms, I mean, this might be within a few milliseconds that these are arriving. Um, so it has to be a very quick process. Um, and that means that you're, it's gonna be very susceptible to uh, a lot of perceptual distortion. It's gonna be really obvious that you're doing something and it doesn't sound good. I've listened to it, uh, you know, the raw version of it and it's not good. So how do you get decorrelation like this without impacting sound quality? That's the question. So we have three more variables we need to talk about. How quickly do we need to update the TDIs? We have this thing called interpolation factor and a high frequency time constant, which I'll explain in a second. But this illustration, this is something that John came up with for his uh, PhD thesis that actually um, is pretty intuitive. It, it clearly illustrates what's happening. You've got a direct sound, which is the blue arrow, um, where it's changing the TDI it's being process processed with over time, where the first arriving sound is TDI2, second arriving is TDI3, third arriving is TDI4, but the early reflection kind of has a jump on the direct sound, if we assume that some of that direct sound has already moved past the listener, where it's effectively time lagging the direct sound. So what's arriving at the listener now is TDI1, where the direct sound has TDI2, so they're not correlated with each other. So you shouldn't get comb filtering. That's the idea. And effectively, these dashes need to be spaced close enough so that they don't just fully encompass the uh, early reflection path length. So the update rank, uh, update rate, um, we figured this out. It's room dependent, so you need to know the dimensions of your room, uh, where the maximum effective update rate is the average time distance of arrival between the direct sound and first early reflection. So we're taking an average of what's happening in the room. We're not necessarily going by the absolute um, earliest reflection. We're you know, kind of getting a best fit scenario. Uh, and the TDIs, we are overlap adding them by one third of the audio frame, just so there's not this discrete sharp transition between them that would be very audible. Interpolation factor, uh, even though we did the overlapping, we found that you could still hear the tonality change as you went from TDI to TDI. Uh, it was a weird audio effect. So we found that you actually had to interpolate between two adjacent TDIs to get a smoother transition. Uh, this does impact on the decorrelation. I'll show you how in a little bit. Um, but um, yeah, it just ensures that it's a perceptually transparent process and we're not uh, audibly distorting the signal. And then lastly, um, just by accident really, we found that the high frequency decay constant actually is almost like a gain control for this effect, where above four kilohertz, we're setting the same decay constant for all frequencies. If it's higher, you get um, a more pronounced uh, decorrelation effect less and you get um, a more subtle effect. So it's almost like the gain knob for this whole thing, which is kind of a happy uh, happy uh, accident that we stumbled over, but we kind of used this as a kind of a single control for the whole thing. So the process is audio frame comes in uh, to the dotted box here. You're drawing from a pre-generated TDI library, which is compiled into a matrix. Uh, and that matrix of TDIs is convolved. 
um, with your audio input frames going to every individual source. And that's repeated every single time frame. So that's the process. I mean, once you've generated the TDIs, that's the hard part. And then it's just convolution, um, which there are plenty of plugins and um, things available for that these days. So this is where um, we really needed to see with the dynamic DSP if it was doing its job. And it's one thing to listen to it and say, okay, I can't, can't hear the difference, that's fine. Um, but is it actually decorrelating the early reflections from the direct sound? Uh, so we ran the same experiment again as we did before in the acoustic space, varying the absorption from nothing to full, um, where you can see the static DSP, the dotted line there, that's what we got before. Dynamic DSP, this was spatial variance and clearly it is reducing um, the spatial variance once comb filtering becomes a big issue in that room. And in most cases it is below the just noticeable difference for the subwoofer band. So it did the trick. Um, you know, and I kind of compressed this into just a few slides, but this was well over a year's work uh, by John Moore, kind of, you know, um, you know, just kind of pulling his hair out, you know, bashing his face against uh, the computer monitor, trying to get this to work in a unperceptual, you know, non-perceptual way um, that doesn't color the audio. So I think it was quite a big achievement on his part, and uh, he did a very good job with it. Um, so we did a fun experiment where I published it, um, where we published a paper at AES in Dublin uh, a couple of years ago, where we took a single subwoofer in a room and decorrelated it with itself um, to see if it got rid of the room mode and comb filtering issues. Um, and in certain audio content we played through, we were looking at a 70% reduction in spatial variance. And this was just in a conventional living room, real measurements. So you can apply decorrelation with a single source and it works, um, which I, that was pretty exciting to me. Maybe I'm the only one. Um, we also took some real measurements. Uh, you know, I know in academia, we, we like to hide behind our you know, MATLAB simulations and, and ease simulations, um, but it's important to do this stuff in real life and see if it actually works. Um, so we went into our test space at the University of Derby. Uh, you can see the dimensions there on the screen. Uh, set up a couple DMB um, subwoofers and, and measured it and tried to see what was happening. I should say the trick with measuring a dynamic varying decorrelation process is that it's near impossible to actually get scientific measurements uh, that you can publish uh, because it's not a time invariant system. It's by definition varying with time. So it, we really had to wrap our heads around um, what it was doing and how to properly look at the results. And we decided that um, we would have to look at it in a time windowed manner. And what you see in this graph is the performance of DSP over a varying time window. So we start with just 50 milliseconds, expand it to 100 milliseconds, 170 milliseconds, and all the way up to 10 seconds. Um, and what you see, um, we've done two high frequency time decays, one millisecond, which is the least perceptible, five milliseconds where you're just about starting to be able to hear it. Um, and we're looking at static, which is the black line uh, and the yellow line, um, as well as dynamic DSP. Um, so clearly the dynamic DSP with the five millisecond high frequency time constant, that's kind of with the gain cranked up for the decorrelation. Uh, you know, after it's kind of reached steady state, uh, so to speak, or the acoustics of the room have reached steady state, um, you're looking at between 40 and 50% reduction in spatial variance, um, which is um, very, uh, very encouraging. But it doesn't really start to kick in until about 170 milliseconds. And that's because that's the length of a TDI. So you need to have a full TDI in place before the decorrelation can start. Um, so it makes sense uh, why it's that. I still can't quite figure out why it's better in the very early time frames, aside from just saying that no early reflections have arrived at that point. But I know that's not entirely true because of the dimensions of the space. So it needs a little bit of closer thinking, a uh, closer look at this. Uh, there's still work to be done to fully explain it, but there you go. Um, so that was real experiments. The last thing we had to do uh, to really get this to be practical uh, and something that would be useful uh, for actual sound reproduction reinforcement was to make sure we're preserving the transient content uh, in the recordings. 
So we did a live demo of this. This is the first time we did a demo kind of open to um, members of industry and academics. Uh, and that was part of the Institute of Acoustics Reproduce Sound Conference in 2018, where we set up um, a small sound system in our test space at the University of Derby and invited people in to walk around, have a listen to the system, just playing some bits of music. We got some pretty clear feedback from that uh, in that it was a clear improvement in low frequency consistency across the audience area. Uh, so it sounded the same uh, after we applied our processing, but you lost the impact. You lost that kind of thud in your chest and your gut from when the subs really kick, when you're hitting, listening to the kick drum, it really hits you. It lost that. So that kind of sent us back to the lab uh, wondering how do we fix that? How do we deal with um, maintaining a transient response? Um, I, all it really took was tapping into um, some research that I did back when I was at University of Essex um, with Malcolm Oxford. Uh, we were working on a virtual base system that was trying to um, create a hybrid virtual base system. So this is basically tricking your brain into thinking there's more low frequency content present than there actually is. Um, and I developed uh, a bit of code that just detected the amount of transients in the signal over time, and it would um, automatically pan between the two virtual base effects to get the best possible virtual base uh, effect. So all we did was pull that out of the virtual base algorithm and stick it into the DSB algorithm. What it did was when it found a very sharp transient in the signal, it would bypass the DSB effect. So it very quickly press the bypass button, allow that transient to go through, and then re-engage the DSB effect. Um, and we tested this again with some listening tests and found that uh, very clearly, and this was through scientific um, listening tests, that the transient response was then maintained and there was no perceptible difference between DSB being on and off. So that solved the problem, but that was a bit of a headache for a little while, uh, trying to figure out how to overcome that problem. So overall, um, essentially, this is a big compromise, as are most things in audio. Um, you have a trade-off between interpolation factor, so that's how many interpolation points you have between adjacent TDIs. You also have to consider high-frequency time constant, uh, where the shorter, the less perceptible it'll be, the longer, the more perceptible it'll be. Um, and yeah, I should say interpolation factor, the greater that is, the more perceptible it will be. So you want to try to minimize those to as much as possible while maintaining reduction in spatial variance. So you can see if you maximize, maximize the, uh, or minimize the audibility of both of those, so that's down in the corner of the center plot, um, you're only getting about 15% reduction in spatial variance. Whereas if you say, okay, I can deal with some um, perceptual artifacts, you can get upwards of 40%, um, at least in this experiment that we did. Um, with and without transient handling, at worst, the difference is about 4% in performance. Um, so not too bad. Uh, so you're not really throwing away too much in the performance while maintaining uh, the transients. So yeah, it was encouraging. Okay, overall, I'm almost done. You know, you're probably sick of me talking when I hear some questions or maybe someone wants to come up and start drawing things on the screen again. Um, here in my mind are the practical applications for this. And I'll show you one example on the next slide because I don't want this to go on too long. Um, I think the obvious uh, application, which was really the starting point for the project for John Moore's PhD, um, was left-right subwoofer configurations, whether they be flown or on the ground, doesn't matter. Um, and you could, similarly apply it to the, the arrays that are spaced either side to decorrelate them. Um, that's pretty straightforward. Two channels, two separate TDIs in a static configuration. You apply that impulse and you're done. You don't have to worry about it anymore. You don't need any other knowledge of the system. It's a turnkey universal approach. Uh, you could also use it for horizontal subwoofer arrays. Um, if you're interested, I can send you John Moore's uh, thesis where he has some interesting examples of this but he showed that this processing actually removes to a large extent the power alley um, while still maintaining your array steering, believe it or not. Um, so you could do things um, with horizontal subwoofer arrays, although I think um, the significance of that effect is less than what you get with the left-right decorrelation. Uh, he also tested it on stage monitor systems. So any monitor engineers out there, whoever have used side fill systems, 
you know, walking around the stage, listening to side fills uh, can be pretty phasey, uh, to say the least. Um, so if you apply decorrelation, it can decorrelate um, any um, uh, speaker-based non-IEM monitor system, so you don't get any phase issues on stage. Uh, not to mention if you want to try or worrying about the effect of the stage sound on the front rows of the audience, um, potentially some decorrelation could help there. Uh, Cinema B chains I already talked about. That was kind of the, the beta test of all this. Um, no, I won't go into uh, the debates that are going on about that now, but it's gotten pretty political. Uh, home cinema, like I said, put it on one sub buffer. If you only had one sub, great. Uh, it can help reduce room modes. Uh, loudspeaker crossover networks. This is uh, something that Hawksford has experimented with, again, about 20 years ago, where, you know, I'm not saying that you have to decorrelate the whole audio spectrum here. Uh, this process can target one or more narrow audio bands if you want. And let's say if your problem is between the main PA and the subwoofers in that narrow crossover region, just apply decorrelation there and no one out, nowhere else. Uh, and you can do that very easily with this process. So I think that actually might have more legs than anything else uh, because you're not decorrelating the whole signal. Um, you know, you're just dealing with um, the very problematic narrow frequency ranges um, in the crossover region. Headphone externalization, uh, if you were able to hear the, the demo, you may have heard some of this. Um, but if you're interested in that, um, I, I'd suggest just shoot me an email and I'll send you some test files that you can listen to. Um, because I think, again, it was an unintended consequence of this project, but if you listen to a mono signal on headphones and apply this decorrelation, um, the sounds outside of your head all of a sudden. Um, and yeah, it's just, it gives, at least for me, much more enjoyable listening. So something to think about, and I'm not really interested in it, but if someone else wants to run with it, I'm happy for you to do so. Uh, and then lastly, there are some potential implications on speech intelligibility, um, you know, in talks with guys like Peter Knapp about this. Um, I'm not entirely convinced, but in cases where comb filtering is causing issues with speech intelligibility, possibly, um, this could be a solution. This is one example, this is from John's thesis, uh, of two spaced left-right subwoofers. Uh, I think these were spaced at about eight meters. Uh, it's a simulation in MATLAB showing your clear power rally on the left with the unprocessed signals at 50 hertz and then clear dead spots to the side of that. And then with static DSP applied, um, you get this nice even response over the audience with just your normal propagation loss towards the back. So I can't really give you a, a clearer example than that uh, of what this does. Uh, it gets rid of the comb filtering and that's it. Um, so that's kind of the punchline to all this. Um, on top of that, uh, I am happy to say that this has exited the academic bubble and is actually in the real world somewhere already. Um, one of the uh, acoustic consultants in Australia who I know named Glenn Liebrugen um, at Acoustic Directions, uh, I was chatting with him at a conference and um, we decided to, to give it a go in the real world. And he was using all pass filters and struggling to get enough decorrelation without it being highly perceptible. Um, so I sent him the code for um, diffuse signal processing. He applied it and it is now in the National Library of New Zealand in their theater where they do musical performances, lectures, um, pretty much all of the above in there. Uh, but it's just a left-right system with a sub uh, directly coupled to the main PA, and it has DSB applied to it. So there you go. It works in the real world. We have proof, um, and they're very happy with that sound system in there. So with that, um, just to summarize, hopefully what I've shown is that we do have the knowledge in place to work towards a position independent low frequency listening experience with no additional hardware or calibration required. This is a universal application. As long as you can involve your incoming signal with um, an impulse response that I provide you, you can do it. You can do this right away. There's really um, no need to wait. Um, we focused on low frequencies, so 20 to 250 Hertz, but you can do this to the whole spectrum. There's no limitations there. Um, you do need to dynamically vary the decorrelation if you're gonna use this indoors. Um, otherwise, the early reflections will wreak havoc on the system. Um, and really, the more speakers you can include in the system, the better. Um, so I found with home theater systems, don't just apply it to the subwoofer, apply it to the main speakers as well. 
uh, and you get much improved results um, if you have more degrees of freedom. Uh, but in most cases, we've tested both in the virtual world and the real world. Uh, we've knocked down the um, seat to seat variance and magnitude response uh, below perceptible levels, and that's below roughly 2 dB. So I put in stars at the bottom here. Further work is required to reduce latency of this process. I know Glenn in Australia put his own um, tools in place to do that. For us, um, well, I have an idea of how to do it, um, but the latency is not low enough to my liking yet. I really want to get it down to just a few milliseconds, which is tricky when you're dealing with um, these TDIs, which are upwards of 170 milliseconds. Uh, but there are ways to do it, but I don't really want to discuss that right now. Um, I don't want to kind of show you my entire hand um, you know, before I actually get around to doing it. So thanks for listening. Uh, I think I ended up rambling on a bit longer than I hoped to do. I was shooting for an hour, but there you go. Um, and sorry for the, um, the uh, intrusion uh, in the middle of all this. Uh, you know, things happen. Um, I know Fidelity will, uh, will help to edit this out in the recording that goes online. Uh, but I'm happy to take any questions now, um, or otherwise you can go run away and uh, enjoy what's left of the day. But thank you very much. Hi there, Adam. I have some questions here at Facebook. Uh, Kriakus asks how this decorrelation process affects the time alignment with mains uh, applied to subs. Um, I think for your the general process of doing time alignment, um, nothing changes really. Um, I would time align as you usually would, um, but what this helps you do is. Of course, with time alignment, you're not going to get every spot in the audience perfectly time aligned. You have to choose your calibration point. And I think this helps to make the calibration point less sensitive, uh, meaning that you can get away with worse time alignment in certain places of the venue um, and still not suffer from too much cone filtering. Um, so yeah, but I would, I, I'm not saying disregard all those processes out there for aligning your system. I, I still think it's essential to properly time align your system without a doubt. He also adds, uh, if the bigger distance of the LIR subs uh, give a stutter uh, TDI alignment. Uh, say that again? If the subs are spread uh, way, way bigger, if that gives us a more difficult TDI uh, assignment. Um, the distance between subs, if that... Uh, between subs. Not the necessarily. If they're wider apart, it means that they'll be decoupled to a lower frequency. Uh, but to be honest, if I'm applying this to a left-right subwoofer system, I'm almost certainly going to be applying it to the entire subwoofer band, not just part of it. Um, so depending on how you approach it, there may be a trade-off. But the way I've implemented it in the past, there hasn't been um, that trade-off. Okay, another question. Is there a IF limit uh, to the decorrelation algorithm? Uh, say it again? Is there a HF limit uh, for the decorrelation mm -hmm. algorithm because of the smaller and smaller periods up there? That's the question. No, no, it's actually much easier to do the higher the frequency you go because then you only need a very short time to decorrelate. Low frequencies are the tricky ones. Okay, let me see here. Uh, how, can, how can I produce this practically implemented to an LR system uh, in terms of hardware processors? I think he's asking you what's, what the DSP we need to, to make this go through. You need um, some hardware that you can load in uh, impulse responses for convolution in real time. Um, I know the guys in Australia, they were using uh, some QSC boxes. I can't remember the exact make uh, or model of them, um, but they were able to do that uh, quite effectively. Um, in my mind, what, where this needs to go and potentially what we're, um, you know, Midas might be interested in is either building this in as a plugin in a mixing desk or in a system processor. Um, so it's kind of a, a turnkey built-in solution. Um, and it's something that we're just kind of, we've pressed pause on due to this lockdown, due to the, the current health situation um, before we really start to pursue. 
Uh, but my hope is that eventually this is going to be available um, as a plugin, as something within system processors that you can just turn on and off very easily without having to mess around with loading things in. Uh, well, the last question I have here is how far out is the acoustic center in some of the arrays tested? And does <laughs> the acoustic center greatly change when the DSP and delays are applied? Mm. I know I can't get through a single uh, presentation without someone asking about the acoustic center. Um, I don't know. I haven't tested it with uh, the decorrelation. Uh, it's a very good question. And um, yeah, something that uh, probably should be investigated. But my answer is, I don't know. Uh, okay, I don't think we have any more questions. I, or do you have any questions now? Um, we don't have many people in the Zoom anymore. Um, so I think the only questions I have are my own. Um, can pitch shifting be used to decorrelate left from right? Um, yeah. Yeah, that's been, um, it's documented in the literature um, that it, it has been um, investigated in the past for various decorrelation reasons. Uh, it's almost always brought up in questions uh, every time we present this at a conference. Okay. Um, what we've found is that well, our approach is to try to maintain the audio quality as much as possible. And I know the frequency shifting is very slight, uh, but we found that our process is still more effective while not messing with frequency at all. Um, but yeah, for many decorrelation procedures out there, um, they do use that, um, some to a very good effect. Okay, um, another question I had was, you were saying about the, the way phase looks um, in the lights of SMART. Um, if the uh, if the transfer function happened after the processing, wouldn't mm. that clear that up? It would for the static DSB. And that would be fine, and that's how we got our results for for the static tests. Um, yes, if you did the transfer function afterwards, that's fine. For the dynamic, where we run into problems is that, I mean, you're talking every ten, fifteen milliseconds, your transfer function is going to be changing. Um, and a product system like SMART just can't keep up with that. Uh, and you're going to get some really weird results because of that, because it's changing constantly um, at the output. Um, and I know what you mean, where if you take it afterwards, if you have knowledge of effectively your system input, uh, then you can get a clear response. Um, but it gets messy when you think about, you know, any of the acoustic effects that your mic is picking up in the room. That's, yeah, it's... It's hard to explain, but we've struggled with this quite a bit, and it it makes my head hurt <laughs> going back to you know remembering these these things. Um, but yeah, it's tricky, uh, and it's in my experience, it it never looks good uh, on the measurements on smart things like that. It just doesn't look good. Okay, um, I have another couple of questions if you still want to. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Um, so if you were doing a horizontal array of subwoofers and you were to de try to decorrelate them all from each other, um, I'd expect that you would lose some of the directivity that you would have gained from um, coupling. But is there a way of varying how much decorrelation you have and don't have to? Yeah, we've looked into this. Um, we've looked in for the central arrays to actually do something different uh, for decorrelation between adjacent subwoofers. And then the further out you get, um, essentially the more decorrelated uh, decorrelation you apply. Um, and you do this in a frequency selective manner um, so that you tend to do more decorrelation at high frequencies than low frequencies. Um, and yeah, that to an extent it works, but I'm, I'm still not 100% convinced that it's worth applying for uh, a nicely optimized central array, but it's an option. Okay, uh, my last question was, I think the brand of speakers you mentioned earlier was NXT, I can't remember. The, yeah. um, the, there was a study done in a big church in America where they compared a lot of beam steered line arrays. And I don't know if you saw that one, but there was, um, an NXT speaker, a distributed mode uh, loudspeaker, because they thought they would do really well, but it it sounded really good, but the intelligibility didn't measure well. Um, mm. And I was wondering, is there any limitations in how 
uh, intelligibility is measured that might have made it not measure well, or is it just that the speaker wasn't as intelligible? Um, I would direct you towards Peter Mapp on that one. Okay. Um, I, I'm not an authority on intelligibility. He's the one to talk to, but um, from talking to him about this specifically, um, yes, there's the potential for problems in measuring um, such a system if you're trying to meet uh, an SDI um, target for intelligibility. There's the potential for problems. Okay, that's it. Thank okay, you. that's it. This was a great webinar. I hope to hear it in the future. <laughs> Hopefully, we'll see what happens. <laughs>